Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm trying something without my headset today, so we're gonna start this off with technical operations part one with the movie genius here. Uh, let's see here. Guys, say something. Let's see if we get any of that traditional awesome sauce echo. Hello, good to be here. Hello, folks. Hello, hello. Gotta remember to unmute myself too. So far, so good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Des Lynn Vander's Design Board Game Series, Part 6. The sixth week in a row we've been designing a game, and it has been, uh, it's been a journey. We've got a lot done. Yet, we have so much further to go. But I've got my coffee. Dylan has his lunch. Indeed. Thank you for that, by the way. And Josh has his water, and Peter has his toys. So we're ready to do it. <laughs> I got all those toys in the background. What is all that? We You're just my, envious. Majora's Mask. I am for that beat stick thing he's got. I don't know what the hell that thing we is. got two that. different Armored Core 2 action figures. Ah, I think yes. I have the blue one. And is that what is that little stuffed animal down there? That's from Final, Final Fantasy, Fantasy uh, Final Fantasy, all of them. It's all of them, Real functionally. Why I said, yeah. Huh. Well, okay. It's cool. Well, um... Tom Berry with the knife skill. Ah, yes. Okay, everyone, so the way this is going to work out, if you're new to the channel, because we've had a, a significant bump again this week in viewership, uh, this is a uh, one of our stream uh, channel programming pieces where we as Team Lynn Vander, a company scattered through multiple states in one province of Canada, where we design board games uh, for a living, I guess you'd say, and um, well, some of us anyway, and um, we are going to design a game live, and we've been designing a game for the past uh, five sessions. Uh, the game is called, we, we, uh, we have the acronym COL, K-H-O-L, and um, it is some, uh, the name of the, the literature name is Kingdom Hearts of Literature, which we coined as a fun nickname for the project because it is a uh, classical or a mythological literature. Uh, characters have been coming together to create a uh, an interesting universe, such as like Peter Pan, Robin Hood, King Arthur, all in the same world, um, interacting together. And so that that's that. Um, we have been. We can all introduce ourselves real quick because I think we haven't done a proper introduction about who we are and give a very brief summary as to who you are for all the new people watching. Um, I'll go first. I'm Tommy. I'm a game designer. Uh, I'm an eclectic entrepreneur. Uh, I have a bunch of interesting businesses including my board game cafe back here which is uh, where I'm, I'm streaming from and uh, part of the Six Sides of Gaming crew and I do a lot of things such as film and game design and uh, my, my friends and partners here have been involved in various capacities of those throughout the uh, throughout history. So pass it to my left, right over here, this guy right here, Peter. Uh, that would be me. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I am uh, partners, Tommy, uh, Tommy's partner in a couple of his businesses and have been kind of doing sideline designing with the team for a number of years. Um, although more recently I've gotten fully engaged with the team. Nice. And then below Peter is Josh. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> primary developer and graphic designer for the team. Uh, I do a lot of our, well, most of our graphics work um, and some of our illustration. And then uh, a lot of our game development as well. Fantastic. And then beside him, I'm Dylan. They keep me around because I have armor and horses. Yes, that's that is the primary reason why we keep <laughs> you around. You to sell yourself short. 
<laughs> uh, I do a lot of the, the number crunching and the uh, rule writing um, and most of our story stuff. Um, so I'm kind of the writer, writer math portion. Excellent. Okay. So let's recap. We're, what happened real quick? Sorry, something stuck in my throat. Um, so I'm also the note taker. Uh, the last week we were talking about, we were continuing to talk about what a turn looks like. And uh, we started getting into more specific phases and what the individual loops are going to look like, how we were going to have city building and exploration. And then we spent the majority of the time talking about the different levels of Zoom and what we were doing. Like, for example, we were talking about having, like, all of Neverland as one Zoom level and then a mission book, which uh, is like a map of Skull Rock, and then it goes down into specific uh, combat encounters on a map. And we talked a lot about that going back about whether or not we wanted to have two or three different Zoom levels. Um, because the, the idea being that, like, well, did we want to explicitly separate the exploration phase from the, the combat and have that on a separate thing? And so we spent some time talking about that. That was something that we agreed we were going to get back to this week. Um, and then we right. also were talking about exactly how the Chronicle system worked, what the replayability of the game was, if these were going to be set scenarios and set adventures. One of the things that we have mentioned that I have in the notes a couple of times is that for our Chronicle system, we want to have recurring villains. So very much can, cha or a lot can change based upon what order you do different scenarios, because if you do um, one scenario and then you wind up having a, a villain from that scenario, then that villain can show up in other scenarios to make them more interesting and convoluted and potentially painful. So that's what I have for notes from last week. Sounds right. I think we were starting to drill down into what the overall loop for the game is. And we keep kind of taking bites out of parts of it. And I know we're kind of trying to get back to the sort of holistic view of what is I mean, we have some, there you, Josh, you did that to yourself. Now there's no Tommy sound. Well, doesn't well, sound now it's a sound on. <laughs> so Tommy says just the way you want it, no sound from me. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess. We get to watch a three-second delay from Tommy telling us what to do now. <laughs> It'll be a fun stream. Oh. Okay. The funny thing is, Tommy, if you'd start your cell phone and put it on the table and pipe it through my cell phone in front of the mic, we can go completely <laughs> round circle <laughs> and get it back into the audio feed. Oh my gosh, that would be hilarious and horrible. Yeah. Please, no. Please, God, no. <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, we'll anyway, see if you can continuing. fix it. We'll carry on. Continuing, continuing. Focus. Yeah. As I like to say. So we were talking about whether whether we wanted one book or multiple books as like a play area, because we talked about having kind of an atlas to do exploration upon. Where each each of these uh campaigns would be a different setting with its own characters and its own little mini adventure with several scenarios. And Possibly that adventure is contained within its own little atlas book and its own accompanying storybook, which is odd everything that happens in that little bubble. Because part of what we were talking about with this design was that it needed to be modular, right? You need to be able to kind of do the various quests in whatever order, and then depending on the order you do them, there's some carry forward of whichever villains you've 
uh, squared off against. That seems to be what I remember about the design. And I've been thinking a lot about how to how to get the exploration or the atlas basically to do all of the jobs if it's possible. Probably not the storybook job, but I think all of the play area jobs it can probably manage. No, I think this. Like, I think I think it could easily do the storybook job as well. It's possible. It depends on whether, like, the challenge there is you probably want if the if the book is going to open and it's going to be a game board. Like, let's let's assume for a second the book is like square and the size of the box so that when you open up you get like a two you know a one foot by two foot play area. Do you allocate like a column around the edge for story, for like what what you see in this location? Or do you, uh, or like for special rules or whatever, or do you move all of that out of this uh, exploration book into a storybook or reference book so that you have kind of the two parts separate? Well, so, so, sorry, somebody else started to talk. So I think, I think you can manage a map of a room on one page. And you have rules text, including reference. Um, like we talked about having... Uh, a cardboard component where you would put the miniatures that would need to be populated. Wait, no. What? I'm, uh, wow, different game. Different game entirely. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, brain. Brain. It happens. We do too many. We do too many. Uh, uh, no, but, but again, the rules text associated with populate the room with these things. Um, you know, Different checks you can make uh, the the line or two of story text for the room. And by the way, Dylan, I will say, um, thinking more about it, yeah, if if one of the mid um, line adventures is fourteen rooms, yeah, you're right. That's too much, and that's too much text to write, and that's too much nonsense. But again, if we're talking about a dungeon crawl and we've got direct control over individual rooms and the challenge that occurs in individual rooms, then we've got, you know, a lot of flexibility to play with, you know, a, an entire adventure can be four rooms long. And, and as long as each of those rooms is a significant challenge, that's not too short for anything. Something to, to consider uh, regarding the story and placing it on the map and whatnot. Um, when you put story, there's there's different layers of story, and the term story is a very wide term that can mean to a, a lot of different things, right? Like mm -hmm. um, some games, their entire story is, you could say that their entire story is like one paragraph, which is like the intro in the rule book, and then you set up the, the game and you play the game, right? Like, for example, just... I don't know why it came to mind, but like Scythe, right? It's got a little blurb about this is the story of the game. Then you set up the game, you play, and then you pack it up when you're done. Um, the important thing uh, we were talking, or what Josh was talking about when he was saying, you know, can we put the story on the map board? And is there a way that we can do that? One of the things to consider that is very much true is that unless you want to use what I would classify as an old school and I'm not in favor of it approach. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Uh, you can't put story on that map book and not have it known to players when they're playing the game. Like that's, that's the reality uh, because you can say, Oh, don't read ahead. But even with the best intentions, people are going to accidentally read ahead. You know, like, or you're creating a situation where you're going to make them flip back and forth between different pages if you're just going to try and hide it in that way, right? Which is not a positive experience if you're also using it as your game board. Right. Um, and so when you, we start talking about things, like one of the things that we've talked about, you know, when we were talking about the different exploration phase and whatnot was that, you know, you're trying to figure things out. You're trying to solve mysteries. You're trying to reveal information that can't be all on the book. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be in another book. That could so, be on cards. That could so can be... I can I throw out of a throw out a solution we've talked about in a previous game as well? Mm -hmm. Sure. Lenticular text. What the hell does that mean? Oh, that's that's red lens. 
That's that's lens oh, reveal text. Which is what I was referring to when I said I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 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 issue that I have with that is, is that it's if you it works well for things like codes or one words or two words or three words. But when you're talking about reading full paragraphs, I don't think it's a positive reading experience. And you need a little doodad to like position. So you have to kind of like literally run a, a little screen thing over it. Right. As opposed yeah. to just all the text being readable. See, uh, but I, I actually think that's fine. And I would actually say that um, the way we would do it is we make that the expectation with the game. We provide um, one or maybe two or three just for uh, the fact that lenticulars have a tendency to be a little bit uh, fragile. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of go, our revealed information is primarily going to be in paragraphs of a certain size. And they don't have to be that long, mm -hmm. but being like most of the time, this lenticular is big enough that it fits over the entire paragraph you are supposed to read at this point. Sure. For, like that, for that's me, actually a thing that can be solved with formatting in some ways. Yeah. I agree that there's like room on the, the play area to do that. For me, I just look at the component as like, if it's the game board, like let me treat it as the game board, like the entire thing, just make it the game board. Don't, force me to allocate space to like put anything other than labels on that map because i think that's going to be the main art and focus of the game and if we're also filling it with little call out boxes that have text on them i feel like there's a lot of all of a sudden i have to zoom in and read text that would be fairly small whereas if that text was just on cards that had matching numbers or something to sections of the map you would so a pick certain cards as you got there and B, you wouldn't need to worry about how big that text was because you would hand someone a card to read, right? It's also, like, I'm also thinking of it in terms of visual clutter and not just, um, like, mechanical, you know, will it work and can we get the hidden information? Okay, so... And that's, that's a real challenge with something like this, especially if we're trying to be, like... I mean, ultimately, we'll want to be really efficient with the components, right? So one of my thoughts... Uh, again, I'm I'm imagining something like a ring-bound book, a pretty big yeah. ring-bound book. I think and so. And I'm thinking of it as you have rules text on uh, the left page and a room on the right page. And again, to go to old school solutions, and this is a thing you can easily do with ring-bound books, uh, centerfold is an option. So if we have one in five rooms is actually going to be bigger and more complicated, we can have a folded page in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the book expands. In some ways, this is a little bit like um, the solution that Gloomhaven implemented with Jaws of the Lion, or um, I think Frosthaven as well has a spiral-bound book as a map. Um, and one of the things Jaws of the Lion does, which is interesting, is there's actually there's a primary spiral book which has most of the maps and they're laid out in such a way that like the map will take up like the bottom chunk of a page and sprawl onto the side of the other on the right hand page. Um, and then you'll have sort of a, a weird remaining shape left over for all the text. And that's where they put it, the special rules. And like you entered a room, read this paragraph when this happens sort of text. But then there are some maps that are bigger than will fit on a two page spread. Cause the book is just like letter size. Um, so you actually have a second book, for oversized maps where you open that spiral book and put them together to make a larger square play area. And it it can solve the problem, but it always just felt clumsy to me. Just like, this seems like if you had just committed to having a separate rules book, you could open it, put it wherever you wanted in the play area and have your game board entirely on one big map. Mm. And like there, it, it actually makes more sense for Gloomhaven because the rooms are very self-contained. You're not really exploring room to room so much as you are reading some p story paragraphs, diving into the scenario layer where you set up the monsters and the dungeon and play it. And then you're zooming back out when you're done. I don't know how compatible that is with our idea of like being able to navigate page to page. 
Like, I kind of want that world to be bigger and feel like it's bursting at the seams where we could run in any of these various directions as opposed to being just constrained on a little battle map. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, your audio works. He's back. Yeah, it's been back for a while. I've been enjoying the conversation. (laughs) (laughs) What do you, like, using the standard question that I, that I ask a lot is, is that what do we gain by putting the story, uh, in the, in the book? rather than putting it either in a separate book or rather than putting it on cards. Like we already know some stuff that we lose, right? Like we lose real estate that we could use for the maps, Mm -hmm. right? That's something we know that we lose, but what do we gain from having it there versus having it on cards or in a separate book? I think there's a little bit of a streamlining of setup there. Like if I'm allocating a, a quarter of every two page spread in the book to be an introductory paragraph or some special rules for this region, then I don't have to go and find the matching entry in a storybook or find the matching card and put it in the play area so that I've got those special rules visible, right? Well, like baking to, them in kind of makes and, that helpful. And to be clear, I am totally, I, I, I totally support and think that 100% that we should put up setup instructions and special rules on that board. I 100% agree with that. I'm talking about the story things, the things that you uncover, the things that you discover, the weird things that happen when you open a door or the unknown things that happen when you open a chest or find a secret door or whatever. Those are the things that I'm asking. What do we gain putting those in the storybook versus Um, on cards? So so cards... Or a separate book. Right, right. So... Uh, they have different downsides. They all three of these things have different downsides. I would say the biggest downside of cards is finding and associating cards. Like y- you talk about the streamlining, cards are terrible. Cards are bad. Cards get lost. Cards get shuffled. Cards get confused. I I, <laughs> I can I just know it's a confused you can't card. Do. I've done it before. It's what um, Seventh Continent does. Yes. It's a yes. hard game to set up. <laughs> well, yeah, that's oh, index God. card sorting the game, right? Uh huh. The next card sorting the game, uh, and so so that's one side of it. The other side of it is uh, Dylan. I I would like to have this not get written in the next twenty years, or, or not take the next twenty years to write. <laughs> Jesus. I was like, what? <laughs> and when and when you have a sec separate storybook, you essentially have two page spreads that you have to write out. Now, it doesn't have to be a full-size book. It can be a f- five by eight or smaller even, but but you want to fill a five by eight for every, what, room, every mission? Like, I strongly a... disagree with that statement. Look at so many games like Arabian Nights, um, Legacy of... Mana? Well, <laughs> what, were you say- what were you saying about reading the wrong Legacy text? of Dragonhold. What were you saying about reading the wrong text? What were you saying about being stuck reading? You know, people will read the stuff even if you tell them not to. That just That's... means you don't put them in sequentially. Yeah. Right. There are lots of good time honored solutions to that problem. Yeah. Like yeah. if one room has four challenges in it, it has, uh, or four um, events in it, it has event 67, event 325, event 629. Like, so that's easily solvable if you're in a separate book. Mm-hmm. Easily solvable. Okay. Yeah. The cards getting lost thing, I think, is also... It's definitely something we've been aware of with a lot of our games that have this kind of structure, and particularly with Divinity. Like, the amount of overhead that we had to bake into Divinity to essentially make that game organizable and playable is pretty substantial, like the whole card divider system. Um, but the one thing I do think is possible with this is let me give you like a use case and see if I, I feel like this is a cards situation rather than a storybook or baking onto the game board. But I think maybe it would be useful to talk through this kind of like possible use case. So let's say we've landed the Jolly Roger on Skull Rock. Because we're, we're doing, we're going to do that quest. Quest okay. starts. Okay. We hop off the boat. We take all of our characters. We put them on page one of the map book. It's a double page spread. It's got arrows pointing off to some various caves and you know paths through the woods or whatever. Yep. And we decide that we're going to 
move our characters along these paths and go to this arrow, which takes us to page four. So then we, you know, flip page four. When we do that, there are zones on this page, one of which we're immediately in when we arrive, that are, say, numbered or lettered. And those correspond to particular cards. So if we move into that zone, we'll have to pick up a card and see what's there. Now, that might be, because we're going to design like the campaign, essentially, not to be super replayable, I feel like that zone is probably, the content is fixed. Like, you go there, you know what you're going to get the first time because it has a specific number. But I feel like some of the zones on this map book are actually random. And it's, you get, there are two decks, right? There's a fixed one that comes with the scenario. And then there's a master random deck, which is not region specific. And that has possibly other stuff from like the villain in it. Because then all you really need is to have a small deck that you set up as part of the scenario. That is like the skull rock event deck. And that might only be 15 cards that are numbered. Right. So at least in setup, you've kind of got that set and you've put it aside. I mean, I was actually thinking of a way that we could combine them. Uh, okay. Crazy idea. I don't know if it's a good idea, but crazy Go idea. For Always good ideas. <laughs> um, but I was thinking that, like, you know, you've got your, we're going to, you know, Skull, Skull Rock. And so we're going to Skull Rock. And so we set up the Skull Rock event deck. But, and yes, I know I'm realizing I'm adding another deck here. But there's basically two Skull Rock event decks where one is your random event and one is your events that you have to solve or experience to complete the quest, right? Okay. And what I was trying to think of was I was trying to think of a way that you could present the map and not have players know, oh, we need to go to that location because that location specifically is something that will advance the quest line, right? Uh. And so what I was thinking we could do... Just obliterate it, your video feed, Tommy? Yeah, don't worry. I'll get it back. You're, I'm just continuing. Um, that your random deck could tell you at certain points, draw the next quest card. Oh, I see. So you have this layer of obfuscation so that at certain times you're drawing the next quest card and like the quest cards could be in very specific order. But at this point you're like, it doesn't, you don't necessarily know, Oh, I need to go to X location. I need to go to Y location in order to advance the quest line. You're like, like, Hey, an event happens here. And the thing is, is that um, depending on whether we did cards or whether we did a storybook, right? Like, you can handle this obfuscation in a couple of different ways. Like you could have an event that it, I don't like this. Be, uh, I'm throwing it out there as a brainstorming thing, but I don't like this because I think it introduces too many levels. But like you could say, okay, go to event 25. Event 25 says draw a random event. And so then you draw a random event. Or you could say, go to event 26. And then event 26 says, okay, specifically draw a quest number card or go to quest event three, whatever, but putting in another layer of obfuscation so that we then don't have players know exactly where they need to go and they still need to explore a little bit. And it's a question of, we have a way of making that more or less randomized depending upon how many in-between layers we want to, to introduce. Yeah, it makes sense. There. Then everybody's quiet. <laughs> I think everyone's distracted. The fact that I'm having nothing but the absolute most wonderful of tech issues today. Media genius. Fucking media genius, movie genius. I'll take it all. <laughs> uh... So the using, using the event tech as a timer, I think, is an interesting concept we haven't talked about much yet. Because I do feel like whatever we do with the scenarios in this game... The, the whole idea of exploring the island seems like it should be, or exploring the scenario booklets environment um, map book, I feel like probably should be self-contained. Like there, there's kind of a philosophical question of like, do you make it into episodes or do you make it into one big long game that you can pause and save in the middle of? My preference is episodes. And that's, I fully admit, that's just where I come from, because I feel like 
giving me bite-sized sessions is a lot better to sort of plan my gaming time around. But some people like to be able to just play for as long as they want and then save it. And I think depending on which of those kind of approaches we want to do as well, there are some advantages and disadvantages to one system or the other because of the setup and teardown. I, I do think that's something that we should should discuss and decide because uh, you're absolutely right that there's kind of two ways to do that. And one is to do them as episodes and one is to, to do it as a continuous story. Like, for example, you know, Divinity is obviously a continuous story. You can pause it, change it at any time, come back to it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, lately, um, but like, for example, Terminator is more of an episode game, right? You and it's, yeah, Terminator was intended to be played. The episodes are intended to be played sequentially, but like to form a campaign, but you can jump in at any single episode and play. Right. It. So Alliance, it's actually Star Trek Alliance is the same. Yeah. And it's very similar to, um, the first, I have not played any of them since then, but the first Zombicide. Because oh. the Zombicide, first Zombicide was episodes, mm -hmm. and yep. uh, they were meant to be played back to back, but you can literally just do one right. go. Um, but anyway, um, I've been playing lately a fair amount of Bloodborne, the board game, mm -hmm. and they very much follow an episode um, uh, format where like each episode takes about an hour to play. Uh, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter, depending upon the specific one and how you decide to play it. And I, f I agree with you. I find that that's a much better, for me as a gamer experience, I like setting it all up, playing it, and then packing it all up and going home. I think Although it also lets you control, like it also lets you control like the tension of the gameplay experience or the, the narrative arc. Because otherwise, like if you just let players save wherever they want, they might save like at a weird place in the sort of the tension. And then when they come back to it, they're just kind of like, they're at the wrong part in the storytelling arc, if that makes sense. Cause like, ideally I want every episode to be like, explore a bit, explore a bit, get into a fight. Sorry, I'm watching this go, mess up his video. Oh, I'm seeing him. And then things go just kind of a little bit crazy. Like there's, there's sort of one big, like that. There's sort of one big, um, <laughs> Sort of challenge per episode. I'm sorry, I uh, had to do it. Mm, no, mm, 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 mm. I'm you didn't have to do it. Oh my god, damn, I had to. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So I do this, and we, we're doing this like we're actually designing, and I do this kind of shenanigan shit when we're designing, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I also no, they're just getting the full Lindbender design experience. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, let me just fix the frame here. Super fast. Okay. As you were saying, uh, like, I feel like Josh, you and I are kind of in agreement on episodes, but I'd like to hear what Tommy and Peter think about it. Um, I, I just want to put out rule of cool. What's the rule of cool? I think episodes are cooler. Um, partially I mean, because well, the of what Josh was it. saying about the ability to maintain tension. We can make yeah. each episode feel cool. Right. You kind of, you build an overall story and then you say, okay, well, what are the seven cool moments in that story? Okay, each one of those is an episode. Mm -hmm. Now, every time you sit down to play, you're getting a varied scenario that does something cool. Whereas I feel like it's harder to get that kind of quality pacing if you just let the players decide where to pause. Because they'll pick places to pause that are not good. That are convenient but not good. I I guess I don't understand this difference we're talking about. That's the the thing I'm a little bit confused by. Like, okay, tell what's the opposite? What's a story based game? So a story based game is uh, something like what we've done in Divinity, where at any point in playing the game, you can just stop, pack it up, and then immediately restore it to that point. The game is set up so that you can literally pack everything up, put it in the little divider folders, and then open it up and uh, reset it. But it doesn't have very set beats. There are not set beats that let you know, like, okay, we finished a session, because it is more of a continuous game. Um, yeah, you but, have no concept of where the moments of high tension are going to be in the story in that game, generally. 
Hey. Okay. I, I I think we're talking about a distinction with without a difference because I think what you're talking about is people will end divinity after a combat in se- session and a combat session is a mission. I mean, it, there, there are stories that are told individually. You're talking about endings. You're talk. you're not talking about episodic. You're talking about, um, single story arc versus multi story arc. And I think again, the basic agreement we had in the first place was there's going to be a story arc for each character. So it's going to be multiple short story arcs rather than a single long one. Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, yep. Multiple short story arcs is basically episodes. A single long story arc would be more the you can save anywhere. Okay. There's something in there, though, I you think that's worth pointing out and maybe worth diving into a little bit more, which is the idea of assuming that say, ancient China slash Mulan is a module for this game, and that module has several scenarios, how do you, A, choose which one you're doing? Are they sequential? Or B, how do you know where each one begins and ends? Like, do you start a, do you start a session by going, here are all of the plot hooks that are currently in play, we're going to pick one and pull at it, and that will take us to this, this book, We'll go and explore that region and see how far we get on this little quest thread. And then when we wrap it up, we get kicked back to the ship so we can do that loop again. Well, or do we get a bunch of these threads, realize a bunch of them are in China, and go off randomly exploring on the in the, the China book, where we then can kind of in, try and find which ones we're going to interact with and pull on the threads there. So, do you see what I mean about how that's like a totally different experience? Yeah, so, so my vision for the game was that each character brings with it a storybook. This character comes asking for your help. That storybook okay. encompasses like five missions. Um, so p- players can pick up and play any storybook they want at any time. Our recommendation for how people play would be to pick the group of characters they want to use and go through their stories, Mm -hmm. followed by um, a villainous alliance arc. Right. Where all the villains they've individually battled against get together and try and exact their revenge, right? Yep. Yeah. And then what? At that point, is the... Is the sort of ca- the, the meta layer campaign like resolved? And at which point we would just say, hey, play different characters and go again. Or do we intend those characters to be sort of repeatable? Right. Um, sort of, I think in my mind, it kind of depends on whether those stories have variable endings or not. I, I, I would I would like to advise players to um, kick it and start again. Uh, explicitly because there is a point in every game that lasts too long in any game where you can carry characters over forever where you have hit the max power level and it stops being about growth it stops being about leveling up and becomes strictly a tactics game and you've got a couple of options at that point you can create a bunch of um variants that make it harder and harder and harder (laughs) to the point where it becomes a perfect execution game uh with near perfect luck also required yeah um you can just keep winning and win for the rest <laughs> of time. Roll. Like we're going to steamroll all the stories now because we're all max level characters and it doesn't matter that we've got three trailing villains. It's, it's, you know, so I think yeah. mapping out and, and that's why I think having this kind of villainous alliance. And again, we know that there, that in pop culture of various kinds, there are, 20 different villainous store villainous alliance um archetype stories and those will have to be pretty generic um because we're not running with a specific leader in them um nest but but they'll all the villains will use will go ahead um <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Like, three, like three layers down on your back. So. <laughs> Peter was like, all the villains will go ahead. 
Um, uh, we, we, I think we totally can have specific villains. Like this is actually something. So first off, hundred percent agree. Totally think that we should have kick it and start again. Totally. I think that, 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 that what you say is very true. I know that like when I was playing Gloomhaven, we would get characters to level nine, play a couple of missions. And then we're like, okay, done. I want a new character. Cause I want to try something different um, because it stopped being enjoyable. And once we got all of our characters to level nine, we were like, okay, let's steamroll through the story and finish it just to say we finished it. Can we, and, can we and, impart a, uh, like, I know Goom even has like a retirement mechanic, but can we impart like, uh, this is how the characters written out of the story mechanic, either, albeit like an epic death. Um, for example, uh, mm-hmm. we played Albion's legacy last night on the, uh, on the stream here which was a pretty epic play, like usual. Last turn, last throw, last move, and we won barely. But there are uh, a number of opportunities there that we could have done some pretty story-like moments. Uh, for example, when Arthur throws Excalibur back into the pool, he can do that. In, in th- if he gets the card, he throws it back in the pool. It does something profound to the game mechanic, but that kind of ends his like arc, right? So could there be... Um, could there be like a... Um, uh, again, at some point when you want to retire the character, yes. you could just be yeah. like, "We totally actually have a note from. We have a note from a couple of weeks ago that I have circled about making sure that characters have the ability to have epic deaths to make their deaths feel important. We've, we're already planning on, yeah, and, but can, but happen. can that happen? And I don't know if this is how much more of a difficult design thing is this, but can that happen not at the end of a character's natural cycle? Like, could a character yeah. at level four instead of level nine decide this is the point where my character is going to sacrifice and make that move? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We, we're, we're planning on doing that, totally. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, I was saying that I feel like we should have this sense of the game is complete, and then you start over again. And just like, you know, in Albion's, where you play again and different characters sacrifice themselves, you could play again in this and have different characters sacrifice themselves when the moment comes up. Um, but what I was going to say earlier was that I think we can have a little bit of the best of both worlds. Okay. And so actually what I'm imagining uh, that we can do with this game is, is that when we ship the core game, the core game comes with, say, three mega villain arcs. And you choose which mega villain arc you're doing. And in order to get to the mega villain arc, you have to complete X number of personal villain arcs, which is where they then get into your, your, your chronicle, where they wind up then becoming the recurring villains. This is where you do your individual quests, like you know Josh was saying, the five quests that we ship for ancient China with uh, for Mulan, this is where those are done. And they all factor into this mega villain arc. And the mega villain arc is where the villains have the villain alliance and they team up against you. And that's ultimately what you're trying to do. So right. like I could play as Peter Pan and you could play as King Arthur uh, and Lancelot and we could then wind up doing Mulan's individual personal missions, but then do the mega arc. And the mega arc that we chose could have an ultimate villain. Like yes. it could be more goes in the mega villain arc. And we decide we're doing the more goes mega villain arc, yeah. but we don't necessarily have to do King Arthur minor arcs to get to it. Right. You see what right. I'm saying? Yeah. No, that's interesting. Now I was going to mention something earlier, but I had like all of the technical problems. Uh, and one of the things I want to talk about, it brings us back a stage and then I want to kind of push us forward. Uh, um, in the card draw mechanic, Peter, you were having a game of uh, racquetball. Um, talking about how to the amount of text that you are to read, who reads what, and yada yada yada. Seinfeld. Um, could you could we incorporate? Is it too difficult, or is this not the right setting for this to incorporate something that is more reanimator esque, where the choice, the agency comes into some of the card decisions? So when you draw these random cards from the random decks, there's a there's a a question of more than one option on that card to choose, whether it be a resource cache, an encounter evasion or encounter f- facing uh, a riddle, something that has consequences to the choices that you make, which branch off and may not have anything significant to the overall story, but might have a touch of rule of cool in some agency in the individual encounters that you get. A perfect example would be you encounter a chest. Uh, your options are check for traps, just smash it. 
pick the lock, ignore it. You know what I mean? And then maybe there's like a flip a card or there's like another card deck you go to that has the results. And those results are also what you slot in for what the chest looks like afterward, whether it's an open chest, a maintaining the chest being closed or a smash chest. And if there's a trap, it would go off because it would say so on the card that you pick. I don't know. I mean, like, is there like a bit of a choose your own mechanic that's maybe not index card, the game, index starting cards, the game, but have enough. I, mean, I, I love this idea. And I think it's something that we should definitely do. And there's different ways that you can do it. But one of the games that I think does it really well is dead of winter. Yeah. Cause in dead of winter, you wind up having these choices and you, I've seen player groups agonize over these choices for minutes at a time yeah. where it's like, exactly. Hey, you found some survivors. Do you want to take them back or do yeah. you want to shoo them away? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, ha- and it's really well, simple. Moral layer as well, right? It's on the card, and you literally just flip it after you make the choice. Yeah. Okay, so that, that that's kind of what it makes sense. Now, if we want to reduce the cards for some of the options, you could also have, um, like in Dungeons & Dragons sometimes, the GM gives you, gives you a, a, a chest, and you open this chest. Let's say you decide to open the chest to see what's in it. Instead of having actual cards with treasure that you would draw and say, or whatever the thing might be, you could have a little die, and you roll the die that has the various types of treasure that you could get. So you know in advance the kind of resources that you could get, and you kind of bank on one or the other. Maybe even one of your abilities lets you manipulate fate, like Merlin might be able to say, I predict it's a roll, oh, I'm going to re-roll. It's coins, right? And we need the coins. And then away you go, like, and have a have a like a treasure die or something really neat to to instead of a deck of cards, you know. I don't know. That's, oh yeah, I be... think I think doing a combination, taking it even a step further. I think doing a combination of you know the full ramifications to you know the general idea. Like we can we can make it varied, right? Like you can have the table look up when you're opening a chest where it's like, you know right. what your odds are of what you're going to get, mm-hmm. but other things, you know, exactly what you're going to get. Right. Like, you know, okay. If you free this person, you're going to like, you know, have to then manage them and heal them and deal with them, but you're going to gain an ally or whatever. Yeah. Right. I'm stuck on the dead of winter example right now, which is why I was well, thinking It's almost that, a but... takedown thing too, because in the middle of takedown, we have those, the consequences of your actions that can shadow and the consequences of your actions and takedown will further deal with the development of, of future runs. Like whether you hand the pay data in, lie about it, like they have consequences that because the Chronicle system is what it is, even if it's Chronicle light, the consequences don't have to be grave right now, but they could, some of these decisions could be monumental six scenarios down the road and most of them don't matter. But as a player, you'll, you don't know which decision is going to be really story affecting and which one is just mm-hmm. a trivial as I smashed the chest open. Oh wait, that chest was the, was Morgana Le Fay's chest and inside it was some <laughs> coins that she had coveted that she was going to use to pay off a bribe for some mega arc. Whoops. We didn't know. Right. Yeah. Anyway, thoughts on that and then i I do think there's value in having some kind of um like having a little bit more content than you can reasonably hit in a single playthrough of a particular thing like i think the if if we have like a um, a main story arc i don't think it's a perfectly linear arc i think it is like you know a tree a small tree of a b choices like maybe the quest ends in one of three ways um but they like I love you for oh, saying you know, random small. Just yes. Say that. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, I realize it's still substantial. Like that's. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. I love you for saying small because I, 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 I enjoy and love the idea of having multiple endings and branching story. But like I mentioned earlier, like, and I know we keep referencing other games, and part of the reason why we do that is because other games give us a frame of reference to compare things to and yeah. are easy ways to explain concepts. And it's a um, classic, it's the classic, like in film terms, like how do you describe the movie aliens jaws in a box in space? Boom. Yeah. That's how everyone references things. So keep on. So, um, I really like the way that bloodborne does it because bloodborne has three chapters and the decisions that you make in each chapter affect the future chapters. But then yeah. after three chapters, it ends. So it doesn't become this giant monstrous tree. Because, you know, for, for the programmers out there, it's like if you have a binary choice each level, it goes up by power of two each time you make a choice. 
which means that then once you're like, you know, even four choices into it, you're now at 16 possible options, and then it just starts to grow even more. So limiting it in terms of its depth, I think is, I would rather have us design it with shorter, but wider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that width is actually not one story, it's all the modules together. Like the whole yeah. thing is very shallow, but very wide because you'll go, you know, five scenarios that might shake out in a few different ways. Then you're done that location and that module and the story for that spot. And then you'll take those characters and or anyone you've rescued and added to your roster as a result of that adventure and take them to the next place. Yeah. Like I almost see the team, we haven't talked much about this and we'll probably have to get into this another week at this point. But like the idea of, your team is not just the playable characters that you picked, but it's a roster of everybody you've met, and you can change who you're playing as. Uh, Dylan gave me a big thumbs up there. Yep. So, so let me let me throw out an idea that you guys just gave me, and one that I think creates some of the some interesting possibilities for story stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. So. We're talking about, oh, you do three villains and then a villain alliance arc. What if setup of the episode is choosing all of those things first and then okay. building um, some random event decks and rather than going from beginning to end of one character's or one of the villain missions, you might be jumping between the three of them. Um, so you're doing the, the, the first, you know, you can do the kind of the first two missions of all three books in any order, but you can't do mission uh, three of any of the missions before you've done, you know, those all both prologue chapters of yeah. all three. Um, and then what happens is you have these event decks that offer choices and ask you to record maybe a code, maybe the d decision of that choice on something like a, a chronicle sheet. Yep. Oh, mm -hmm. I like it. And <laughs> so you could be doing, um, you know, let's just say we've got a Mulan mission and a Robin Hood mission and a... Um, a Nazi mission and you're doing something in the Mulan mission, but an item comes up or a decision choice comes up that has to do with the Robin hood that, that came from the Robin hood stuff. Cause you, you took the event cards from the Robin hood mission mm -hmm. and the Anansi mission and the Mulan mission and you shuffle them all together, the prologue ones. And you yeah. run into this thing, you make a choice, you write it down on the sheet. And what ends up happening is in mission three or four of um the robin hood mission that has an effect that has a a, a long term result that mm -hmm. may be in some ways unpredictable i'm almost thinking of like the witcher and how uh choices in the witcher do not have clean uh results clean and predictable results sometimes mm -hmm. which can be really good in that game so um and they're small individualized results that affect one mission they're not grand narrative changing things but they will do things like oh i've got an ally here or i do, or i have an additional yeah. enemy yeah, here. it feels good we, we oh, saved yeah. somebody so long ago and now they're a random add to a battle we have yeah later. i love it i know so i i think this is awesome and the other the other thing that i want to mention real quick yeah, uh which t ties into to all of that is um, having allies and other people along with you factors really well into your heroic ending for a character and then picking up a new character. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So because we're cr crunching up here to the last minute and question and answer period is not really uh, conducive to today's technical babble at the beginning. I, I think we've actually made some strides in progress, but I think at this point we're on like what a turn looks like part, part four, part five. We knew it was <laughs> going to be a long-term thing. But are we at a point now where we think we've got enough of a meat and bones to try try next week to just slot a, a phasing sequence in to see if it works? Or do we still need to to dig in with what we've got? 
uh, and keep fleshing it out. Maybe we've we've basically done a brainstorm wall now of ideas and things that are that we've all really agreed upon. But now, how do these things start to collide together to create that phasic turn? And then, what can you do within each of those phases? And that that has something that I think we really need to start to shell out. And then, I mean, it's not permanent. We could get your A to A to Z, and then you could cut them out and replace them as we go along. But you think we're ready to try and tackle that next week? I thought we've, we've done part of this, haven't we? We've no, done think... part of the, the upper loop, but um, yeah, uh, we haven't done the lower loop. And I think, I think part of today's conversation was about trying to figure out what the lower loop is going to need in terms of ingredients before we can combine those ingredients to make the food. Yep, that's fair enough. I might have been because I... I don't know if you noticed, but I was kind of off for 20 minutes figuring out why everything was breaking <laughs> down around me. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think the whole discussion about whether we were going to do story on cards or the structure of like what those cards or storybooks or how the scenarios are built really ties into how we're going to progress through the game step by step. And then right. that gives us the framework to decide, okay, what do players do turn by turn to drive that action forward? Right. Right. Yeah, and I think that's part of what we still need to to discuss because I feel like at any point uh, either we'll have four very different ideas or maybe not that different, but we'll have four different ideas on um, what exactly you are manually doing on your turn. Yep. Or mm -hmm. we would just summarize it as player turn goes here. I feel like we have enough details to do player turn goes here, yep. but we I do. don't feel like we have enough details of what is in that player turn. Right. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what I'd like to see us talk about next week is what is in that. Like we've, we've started here and we've narrowed it down and now we've narrowed it down. I feel like to play right. turn goes here and let's figure out what is in that. That, that sounds totally reasonable. Uh, on the bright side, hopefully the viewership can, can attest to this. Uh, with all the technical screw we have done today, I believe I fixed your latency issues with your, with your mouths. So when you talk, you actually, we can actually see you in real time and not just a, uh, uh, a, a conversation to be had with, uh, you know, looking like you belong in police academy. So that being said, um, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, I know people are saying that uh, this needs to be longer in stride, but uh, some of us have to have other programming we have to attend to, and this is the one slot that all of us can hit for a strict hour. Uh, next week, we're going to yeah. jump right into this with the tech test, hopefully not uh, 33 seconds before we start stream, and then uh, and then we'll just launch into the program right away at the beginning and, and rock and roll from there. Uh, and until then... Uh, don't forget to watch the rest of it on YouTube. I put the schedule down. Here's a website for Lynn Vander if you need to take a look at it. And uh, I'll sign off with a uh, words of advice for Darian Coldstone. There you go, buddy. And we will see you guys uh, later. <laughs>